welcome to this month's episode of Money Mountaineering with Peter Newarth, actuary and author, talking about what's your money worth. Today, we celebrate season two, episode one of a new series talking about the shared economy. Pete and his guest today, Steve Shirell, they are in Santa Rosa, California, where it's a community of, it seems like, like-minded folks. And they're going to talk about Steve's amazing store. And to celebrate this idea, we are they are sharing a mic. So take it away, Pete. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Hope. And, um, and thank you, Steve, for, for uh, joining me. And uh, I am going to embarrass you a little bit by telling the story. Um, but first, I want to just give an introduction to this, this new um, series of podcasts we're doing. I mean, for the, for the last 10, 10 episodes, I've been talking about money and how the in the world of money, it's necessary to what you need to do to navigate through the, through the world of money. And in particular, what's involved in planning for retirement and other important uh, aspects of that, that journey through life. Well, one of the uh, bumps in the road in my journey through life occurred uh, back in 2020 when my house burned down in one of the many wildfires that we have here in, in Santa Rosa. And, um, you know, it took me a while to recover. And, and it's part of why I, I love Santa Rosa so much is because this is a this is a town that's very used to um, those who have lost their homes through fire and know what to do about that. Well, this was a couple of years later, and I largely recovered, and I wandered into uh, Stanroy Music, which is a uh, music store in downtown Santa Rosa, and I started looking at uh, drums because among the things I had lost in the fire was an African djembe drum that I used to, I really love, but I hadn't gotten around to replacing it and the insurance money had run out and, but I wanted a djembe. And so I was looking at djembes and I, I asked uh, the, uh, the salesman, a guy, guy named Tim, um, he came over and said, what, what, are you, what are you looking for? And I told him my house had burned down and I was looking for a djembe to replace uh, the one I'd lost. And he said, uh, well, just pick out what you want and just take it. And I said, what, really? And he said, oh yeah, do that. And come to find out that the reason I could do that was because of Steve, the, the owner emeritus of Stan Roy. And so I wanna talk about that with Steve and the fact that rather than pay money for that thing, I got the thing itself. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to actually share things as opposed to going through the medium of exchange, which is money. So Steve, tell me, please, why did I, why did I get that djembe and what do you do in there at Stan Roy? Well, at the time, I actually was not owner emeritus. I was still owner at the time. Now I, I wear the purple robe at graduations. But uh, um, it's uh, it was how I was raised. And what allowed us to keep uh, Stan Roy from closing in 2013 when the current owners had run it into the ground, for want of a better word, um, was sadly my father's inheritance. And I inherited the money never felt like mine. The responsibility felt like mine. And what I had to do was think, what would my father do with that money? But what would the next generation do keeping that in mind? Because that's what the next generation is for. And, you know, I had worked 30 years at that store. One of the, right, one of the greatest coins of the realm that my father taught me was loyalty. And, um, I once heard uh, someone told me that different generations have different words to describe their relationship with work and baby boomers, it's company man. And I always said that never as a disparaging term, but something it's like my father would say, if you're not, if you're not loyal to the place, if you're not 10 toes in, go work somewhere else where you are. And uh, so after 30 years there, uh, it was either watch the place go under or you know, salvage this store where he and I used to go into there in the 50s when he bought 78s. 
So we go way back. <laughs> well, Stan Roy has become a real institution in, in Santa Rosa. I mean, it's not just a store. I mean, it's a, almost a community center of sorts. So that um, goodwill or loyalty that, that you've been able to generate has paid many, many dividends. And um, can you tell me a little bit more about the things that go on at, at Stan Roy Music these days? Well, I, th I think one of the things that's as long as I have been there and from what I know historically is true um, is having brass and woodwind repair. And there are other stores that can fix a guitar, although we still get most of the referrals for string instrument repair. Um, but there's no one, uh, you know, you have to go to the Bay Area or ship it back to Badger in Wisconsin or whatever in order to get a flute fixed. Uh, and if you've got a gig that day and your pad fell off your flute, you need it fixed now. And so that's something that you can't get on the Internet, um, at least not. I mean, yes, you can ship it somewhere and you can find that person on the Internet, but you can't walk in and get it taken care of. Right, right. And uh, I imagine uh, a lot of people not only share their music with the uh, with the repaired instruments, but they share their stories and their and their um, their expertise. And there's a lot of sharing that goes on in that in that music, isn't there? Uh, there are, and it's you know that's one of the things, especially the teachers, uh, private teachers, uh, teachers in the school system. Um, they the only way they can have their programs is to have people like Gary and Bruce in there fixing their horns. They, I mean, they could not do that. Mm -hmm. And if I had brought a picture of all of the uh, horns that are waiting to be fixed in summer repairs, you would appreciate, you know, where do you go? You can't mail out hundreds and hundreds of these instruments and they all come to us. Right. So that's, right. that is something we offer that's unique. And, um, and there really is a music scene in, in Santa Rosa, isn't there? That that uh, Santa Roy, Stan Roy is, is really a part of. I mean, I I saw your your stage set up at the at the Railroad Square Music Festival, for example. And we do. I mean, that's our. I, I suppose that's a sharing. I, I always thought of us in an advertising economy, but but certainly to you know to underwrite stages for uh, the Railroad Square Music Festival for Peace Town. Um, Stan Roy is uh, underwriting uh, the song service at the Lost Church, mm -hmm. where they have three singer-songwriters every month get there and tell their stories about where their songs came from, perform them, and get an audience, some for people who've never had one before. Well, uh, well, as I say, we I, I'm a real believer in the sharing economy because, um, as I say, money gets in the middle, and it's it's not about... I mean, what do we use money for except to buy things, services, experiences? So why can't we just share those experiences and things directly? Oh, and we, we can. It's not common. As I mentioned before, if someone wants a guitar, it's really nice not to have to figure out how many sheep pelts they have that's worth that guitar. And to have a medium of exchange that's agreed upon is helpful. But I had someone come in and he needed a repair. And uh, he was a web designer and a friend of mine needed some work on his website. And I said, I'll fix that, you fix his. And friends are friends, so I didn't need that completion of that transaction. Right, but there's also, there's a trust and a connection that happens that, that, that seems to be more necessary than in a, in a more traditional economy. Amen because it's it's more human. I mean, we do forget, I think at times, what that that medium is just a medium and people get, I mean, you know, there's stories and movies and books and all sorts of things about, you know, the movie Wall Street or whatever, where it's just, you know, corporate greed, greed is good. You know, it's like, no, not for everybody. You know, what's good is we get to do this, we get to do this. Uh, that's important. That's what community is. Right. right. And one of my favorite things to say on the topic is, what is the source? What's the etymology of the word economy? It's the Greek oikos, which means home or house. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, economy and ecology both come from the same word. Right. Right. It's, it's all about home. Right. So 
Home means if you're trading in an economy that's based on home, everybody you're trading with is your family. Right, right. And that's uh, that's different. And, and, that, uh, and uh, almost of necessity, that's a local phenomenon, is it? And it's, and it's a real world phenomenon. It's, it's local. I mean, having been places, having like worked disaster relief in the Southeast, I have a lot of kin that I never would have met if I hadn't mucked and got houses and worked tent kitchens and stuff in the Ninth Ward, whatever. And now these are people. So, you know, there's a woman that I worked with after uh, 2016, the floods in Baton Rouge, and she tapped into tent kitchen fed thousands. She was great. And she just got it. She got it. Moved. She made it work. And later she was diagnosed with MS and she needed a new HVAC system for her home. And she had no money to do that. And at the time I did. Mm -hmm. So if I hadn't worked for this woman who just right. won my heart, I, you know, I would say, yeah, people need stuff all over the place for, you know, for $5,000. Think of what I could do with, you know, feed the children or do whatever. There's a whole lot of things you could do. Well, you know, and, I would like to be able to do more. But when someone that I've worked for who just brought it mm -hmm. in the best sense of community and right. humanity, right. Right. Uh, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't not. You know? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a newbie to, to Santa Rosa. I mean, I just, I bought my property in 2012, but you've been around, um, in and around this, this area for, for a while. Um, how has it changed? Well, the, the population is one of the biggest changes that you feel as someone who was born here in the 40s. I think it wasn't really, I think, until probably when I was 12 and taking geography at Herbert Slater Junior High. They're now middle schools. And, uh, and you know, so we talk about populations of things. It's the first time I think I actually appreciated that Santa Rosa had a population. That is. And it was 25,000 people. Yeah. And it's more than six times that now. And the funny stories, of course, is where people will come up and they will complain about all the people moving up here. And they said, yeah, when we moved up here from L.A. in 82, it was a much nicer place. And I look at them like, do you hear what you just said? Well, <laughs> because they're thinking all these people coming in after they came. Right. Well, change, change is hard. But um, the only constant we have. Right. Right. <laughs> well, what do you like I said, I'm, I've been. Um, you know, I was I was a victim of the fires. I was also a survivor of the fires because in 2017, um, my house did not burn. And of course, when 3,000 other houses did burn, I felt compelled to offer my houses to to those who had lost their shelter. Um, but that's when I found that's when I thought the uh, I, that this is a very special place and. What do you see as the effect of the fires on on Santa Rosa? Have you you've you've been through more than a few? Uh, yeah, actually, 2017, with it, with the exception of jumping the freeway because we didn't have Hurricane Force mm -hmm. One winds in '64. But if you look at the '64 fire and you look at the Tubbs fire up to 101, it's almost a exact footprint. Right. So uh, I read one of my dearest friends at the time was working on the fire line there. And sadly, right near where a lot of poison oak was burning and he was just unrecognizable. But, you know, people pitched in, uh, you know, to do that. But that's I mean, I don't think that's unique to Sonoma County. No. Um, I, I think you that's what you do. And that's one of the things that often brings people together uh, working in the southeast in red states coming from California and everybody knows that's where I'm from. You know, it's like what I, I never got any, you know, no one called me hippie though. I would have taken that as a badge of honor, but, but, you know, people just appreciated that someone got in a car, drove 2,500 miles on their own dime and saved their home. Right. So I think that's one of those things of, it's not just, you know, all this, if, you know, I guess for hippies and Hindus and new agers, you know, that sort of third chakra stuff of economics, uh, you know, governance, education, all of that stuff. That is the family of families. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much to go somewhere and pitch in where people realize it's like, this guy from California, from that place that we always say nasty things about, 
just came and saved our home. You know, would that the earth could be a community, but um, it sounds like you, you know, you still have those hippie values and there's plenty of hippies still around. Um, there's generations of them. Right. I work with three generations of hippies when I go do post-disaster relief right. after a hurricane. <laughs> and yet, and yet, one of the interesting things about um, Sonoma, I, I, Sonoma County, and Santa Rosa, is how diverse it is, and how many, you know, there are the there are hippies, and there are a lot of Mexicans, uh, a lot of immigrants, a lot of people who are, you know, eighth generation, or maybe not eighth, but fifth and sixth generation homesteaders, and um, yeah. and a lot of other, you know, immigrants and immigrants and outlaws mm -hmm, and, um, mm -hmm. what what do you make of this of this kind of diverse county that we live in well it's it may be not uncommon i know that there are places that are a little more monoculture mm -hmm. um and i think that we're lucky uh to have the uh, you know what diversity we do have we there are a lot of ways in which people think pretty white place, you know, and, and might look at that and going like, you know, we don't really, yeah, it's, you think it's diverse, you know, go to Oakland, you know, and so, um, but it's, I mean, the people here are the people who live here, work here, trade here, share here, and, and why, why it's how it is that makes it in the way that it is different from another place. I, I, don't really know. I mean, there are places that certainly uh, where I've been where they were very much community organized, mm -hmm. and 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 I think that they were much more monoculture, so it was easy. I see. You know, I mean, places where I've traveled in the southeast a lot, especially because of that, there there are a lot of places where there's not a lot of dissenting voices. Right. And yet here here we have lots and lots of people who disagree, probably voted for different candidates oh, in yeah. the last election, yep. and yet. Everybody seems to get along and look out for their neighbor, by and large. I haven't seen it come to blows yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so tell me, um, and we don't have that much more time, but tell me what, you, what you're doing now in the community. I mean, you're very busy. I mean, I, I see you, whenever I try to walk, wander in, I never find you because you're out doing something and taking care of something or looking in on something. Um, I what, might be at the gym taking care of me. Well, um, well, uh, most actually, when when people ask how how's what's retirement like, what what is that? And I say I'm trying to cut back to six days. Uh -huh. And when they ask how that's going, I usually say not very well. Uh -huh. So uh, and it's the time it's the time of the year when Gary in the shop will also be there on Sundays. He worked the Fourth of July as well because you know school starts in a month. We have hundreds of unrepaired instruments to get done. So. Right now, a lot of my time is is you know at Stanway doing repairs. One of the uh, one of our main the person that I train to take most of the guitars off my bench is traveling as a guitar tech for a, a reggae band that's touring the entire country. So now I'm working his bench and mine. Oh, so you, I'm kind of stuck there well, a lot. But you you have you <laughs> you have found time to write a couple of books too, right? Well, over the decade, sure. Oh, but aren't yeah. you working on that one now? Or I am working on one so now. So tell me, tell me what you're working on. Uh, it's a disruptive dictionary. Disruptive for, dictionary. What is that? Um, well, as you probably know, disruptive, uh, I think it was in 90, somewhere in the 90s. I won't guess the year, but I have it in my book. Somewhere in the 90s, the word disruptive took on a new definition. And what that meant was groundbreaking or, you know, sort of, taking the old stuff and, you know, as, as you were doing with sharing the economy here. Um, and so what I wanted to do was all of my books have been about language and consciousness. And I've just, they get more fine tuned as I realize it's like, okay, that's like an old car that's, you know, still got a good generator and good tires and good this, and I'll part it out and put it in the next car. Mm -hmm. This is the car I hope will actually hit the road running. Right. Um, but the purpose of a disruptive dictionary is to wake us up from the fact that we're used to using words without knowing what we're saying. I, I admit, I hold NPR to a higher standard. So when I hear them say centered around, I cringe every time. My late brother, who was a, a journalist here for the Press Democrat, 
that was his pet peeve. So I have to keep that going in his honor. But uh, there are people that don't know the difference between compose and comprise. That's not just a nitpick grammar thing. Um, there are words that absolutely spell disaster if we don't understand them. Okay, so let me uh, let me finish up with uh, one uh, word that I'd like you to define is what what is what is money? What is money? Is money in your disruptive dictionary? And it is. I have one of the chapters is called Home Economics, spelled with a K for ECOS, and um, and the subtitle is Accounting for Ourselves. And and it it's I will probably say uh, you know you can read. Uh, the Big Short, or you can read Money Mountaineering, or there's a lot of things if you want to understand why in 2008, when the economy went to hell, there were six over $625 trillion invested in side bets on bets, what they called exotic financial instruments. So right up front, I will say, if you want to learn about that, go talk to the people who really know that. I want to talk about the fact that there's only one currency we have to spend, and that's the time and energy of our lives. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's a that's a great note to, to end this on because um, time and energy really is all we have, and what we do with it, and how we share it, and how we how we it, spend it, and how we spend it is how really, we save it. I mean, we use yes. the economic terms that's for that right. very thing. That's right. Okay. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being here. This thank was you. really great, and it's. The first of, I hope, many um, more interviews with local people who are doing good, really good things and helping this community become a really special place. So thanks very much, Steve. Thank you for this. Awesome conversation. I love what you said. Kinship, love, connection, and family. Like If we could just live by those principles, that would be a magical place. <laughs> yeah, it would be a magical place indeed. The Shared Economy, a fantastic conversation for season two, episode one of Money Mountaineering with Peter Newirth. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, founder of Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV, where you are watching this podcast and video. We very much look forward to episode two with a woman named Becca. And tell us a little bit about Becca, Pete. Well, Becca is a, uh, the, the manager of the local Barnes & Noble. Uh, store here. And uh, so Becca is a big champion of brick and mortar, real life, local bookstores, sharing ideas, curating ideas, communicating ideas, and also runs uh, one of the open mics in town where artists and songwriters come and share their gifts and their, um, their art. And um, we'll talk more about that next month. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for listening to Money Mountaineering with Peter Newer. Thank you, Steve. We really appreciate your time and your brilliance. Keep up the great work. <laughs> thank you. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We will see you again next month. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs. Proud to be here with you. Yeah.